Dr. Levi, thank you very much for joining us here at the Rock Ethics Institute. Uh, one of the first questions that we have for you is, can you please introduce yourself for our audience and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Benjamin Levi. Um, I grew up in Kansas. I did my undergraduate in philosophy at uh, Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. I did a uh, master's and PhD at University of Illinois and also a medical degree. Uh, my residency was in pediatrics uh, in Savannah, Georgia, and then I have been at Penn State now for about 14 and a half years with joint appointments in the humanities department uh, at the Penn State College of Medicine and the pediatrics department. I divide my time roughly a third of my time is uh, doing clinical medicine, treating children, uh, teaching residents and medical students, and you know, two-thirds of my time is doing research and education in the field of bioethics. Uh, I co-direct a course on uh, bioethics and professionalism for medical students, and much of my work involves issues of decision-making, uh, much around end-of-life decision-making, but also with regard on the other end of the spectrum to uh, child abuse and reporting of suspected child abuse. Can you tell us a little bit more about the particular ethical issues in research involving children? What are the most specific and the most challenging ones at the same time? So with regard to doing research with children and thinking about ethical issues, there are probably three or four major ones. Um, one is our fiduciary duty to um, protect the interests and promote the interests of children, which involves not subjecting them to undue risks that are associated with doing research involving them. And on the other hand, not ignoring them or uh, protecting them so much from those risks that they cannot benefit from the research. And so some years ago there was a requirement by uh, government funded uh, research that children and women and others who are historically unrepresented in research, particularly pregnant women, um, be represented. And so there's, that's the, the double-edged sword of you want to involve them and protect them at the same time. The other issue, of course, is that there are uh, challenges in terms of gaining appropriate consents and how do we engage children and at what level do we engage children when we are looking for either consent or in most cases assent in terms of um, their own buy-in to the research project. Um, children have special interests and special needs and as researchers we're often driven of course to get our question answered. And the conflicts of interest that exist between the research enterprise and the uh, participants' well-being and interests and so forth, it takes on special dimensions with children because so much is unknown about their future. And also s often um, we don't always have a great handle on, for a given child, how we respect their wishes while also promoting their interests. One of the pillars, uh, pillar principle in biomedical ethics is obviously a question of autonomy mm -hmm. that gets translated in respect for persons uh, that ultimately we gain this powerful notion in biomedical ethics of informed consent. Uh, how do you as a practitioner overcome this difficulty in research involving children precisely because you just spelled out the difficulties in gaining a full informed consent? Um, so the, pro the, the challenge of informed consent um, and respecting uh, research, uh, respecting autonomy and respecting persons um, when engaging children in research is very easy for me because I don't do any research involving children. So uh, the work that I do that concerns children involving research is about uh, adults' decision making with regard to reporting children for sus or and families for suspected abuse. So I'm not engaging children, I'm not putting them at risk. Uh, 
the areas where I am directly involved with uh, clinical research involving patients is in end-of-life decision-making and those people are uh, either elderly or very infirmed and they're always adults um, above the age of at least above the age of 18 so for me that's very easy to navigate I think that the deeper question is is when you engage with children how do you both respect their person and in a deep sense, and how do you gauge their sense of personhood? Because for those of us who distinguish being a human being from being a person, there's certain kinds of attributes and characteristics that a being has to have in order to qualify as a moral person, right? not a colloquial person. So for that, you, know, you need engagement, and that is dialogue. And um, I enjoy very much uh, engaging with children. They're interesting. Their minds are elastic and creative. And if you have the time and you the concern to develop skills to talk with children, they'll tell you many and great things. Uh, the philosopher, um, uh, I forget his first name, Matthews at uh, University of Massachusetts uh, Amherst has written several books about doing philosophy with children. And he demonstrates that even at a very young age, you can engage children, perhaps more easily than adults, to consider thought experiments and to be intellectually adventurous in terms of exploring ideas. And so I think if, if you want, if you're willing to listen, children will tell you a great many things about what matters to them and how we should respect them as persons. You just mentioned some of the work that you are doing with respect to child abuse. Um, and in your work and the Lookout for Child Abuse Program and the Penn State Suspicion Project, how do you define the threshold for uh, this, those conditions for mandate reporting? Um, obviously, when the notion of mandate reporting comes back, people already fear that false accusation could easily come into play. So how can we distinguish between false accusation and something that you call, for example, reasonable suspicion? So in terms of coming to terms with understanding and applying reasonable suspicion in the context of reporting suspected child abuse, there's an intellectual um, task of understanding what suspicion is and that I've done some conceptual clarification of that um, and reasonable is a qualifier that depends upon the context in which the question is being asked so I think that there on one level there's a lot of education that we can do with people to help them understand what suspicion really means that it's not what many people think which is a weak form of belief but rather it's a feeling a particular kind of feeling and I've I've argued that it's a feeling that is interwoven with meaning in the sense that when one walks into a room and has a sensation of a terrible smell and then someone tells you it's a particular kind of cheese that you happen to like and you go, oh, oh, that's nice. The smell itself changes in part based upon the meaning that it has for you. And I think that the feeling of suspicion is similar in that regard. It's multidimensional. And helping people understand that as um, so they can in better utilize the concept of suspicion in protecting children, that's an educational enterprise. In terms of where you gauge the threshold for reporting, that's an empirical exercise. And that depends upon how many false positives and how many false negatives we're willing to tolerate. The, we're at a stage right now where I and colleagues are still trying to convince people that we don't know and we have no consensus about what reasonable suspicion means because people are in denial about that. It's, it, it troubles people to think that they're using a standard that has no definition. But where that threshold ought to be depends upon it's a social calculus. How much our society is willing to spend to or invest to protect children? What kinds of harm we're willing to tolerate and how much harm we're willing to tolerate. Um, it's like a speed limit or, or a algorithm for doing your, for 
diagnosing something as a urinary tract infection. We say that if, there are, if it's a clean catch and there are 100,000 colony forming units, we say that is a urinary tract infection. And we're willing to tolerate so many false positives and so many false negatives. What, how many of each we're willing to tolerate depends upon what's at stake. And the notion that one should report whenever one's in doubt would result in a lot of false positives. To report only when you're absolutely certain that a child has been abused would be a lot of false negatives. So figuring out what is the cost to the system and what we think of those costs, both in terms of financial, emotional, physical, the well-being of society, that's an empirical question. And if you do good research into looking at what are the differential costs for those differing thresholds, then you have good data on which we can have a community discussion about where we should set that threshold. Uh, I'm really interested if you could tell us a little bit more about how the kind of work that you're doing uh, and whether it, it's possible and if you see any bridges, uh, how has this work ended up being part of a policy? Um, because there is certainly some distance yeah. uh, between the conceptual work that you're doing and the legal setting in which some of those ideas might end up playing a role. I have, I'm very familiar with that distance. <laughs> so the question of how to connect the conceptual and the other kinds of work that I'm doing with actually making a difference in, in the lives of children and in the, the lives of people who are expected to uh, apply this threshold and this mandate for protecting children. I've, d I've gone about that several ways. So it, making a difference, I think, if you're going to do it well, begins with conceptual clarification. And I and a colleague of mine, Greg Lobin, did that work uh, almost 10 years ago. It then begins with trying to validate whether or not your conceptual framework is actually mirrored in the world, or rather mirrored, is reflected in the world. Um, and for that, I did a variety of empirical studies looking at how people understand and apply the concept of reasonable suspicion, and it bore out what we thought, which is that there's no standard definition and that people set the threshold and the, define the meaning in enormously varied ways. The next part was to raise those data to a level of policy that people sh should recognize that there is a problem because part of the job of being, I argue, and a bioethicist is making people intellectually uncomfortable with things they thought were fine because you've pointed out things and concerns and problems that they may not have been aware of or fully uh, appreciated. So writing papers, giving talks, those sorts of things can raise the issue to people's consciousness. The next phase is ideally getting again better data about those, the different thresholds and what they would mean. And that, that's much harder uh, if you're going to do it in the real world. And I have not found a way in to do that. But what I have done is then begun to do some educational programs um, on to help people develop a more systematic understanding of reasonable suspicion and their responsibilities and advocate that if they take a systematic process, then they will do a better job protecting children. So a project I'm currently involved in involves creating an interactive online gamified um, educational program for early childhood practitioners. Um, we have video clips. WPSU has been very involved. The uh, Department of Instructional Design has been working with us. And we're targeting early childhood practitioners. Those are people who work in daycare centers and, and home care for young children who are the most vulnerable towards, uh, with regard to abuse. And the learner will uh, work at a computer, will be presented with um, real life type vignettes in uh, voiceovers and video clips, will receive uh, uh, textual information, will receive uh, 
queries in terms of questions that they answer that provide didactic responses to them. We'll also have different uh, stop screens. So depending upon the answer they give or the response they give, they will then be shunted down a different path in the educational program. And we're tracking all that. So we're looking to see patterns of decision making. In turn, we're looking to see what people understand and how they apply it. And the goal is, is to better understand how people think about this issue, what kinds of decisions they make, so that we can develop better educational interventions for targeting weaknesses or misunderstandings in the people whose job it is to protect the youngest and most vulnerable children from abuse. We're switching gears a little bit to a slightly different question. Uh, the Rock is working to expand their concept of research ethics this year. Uh, obviously, we're interested in continuing to include the core areas uh, in responsible conduct of research, but we're trying to see how we could move a little bit beyond what we saw as a fairly limited framework in order to think all the difficulties that we can find in research ethics. Um, and there is sometimes fairly little consensus how far what still falls within the domain of research ethics. So from your own medical research ethics perspective, are there any specific topics that you think they should genuinely become even more of a part of this research ethics? Domain? Well, so the, the question of how far to push the boundaries of research ethics in a way that goes beyond traditional issues, but not so diffuse that it, it loses its connection. I guess as a clinician um, who sees patients, some of the things that may seem settled to me are far from settled. Uh, particularly in terms of, as, as we were discussing earlier, respecting patient autonomy and understanding decision making. The issue of informed consent is, to me, quite interesting, actually. And I think that it's not about forms. And it, in certain ways, it's about deep dialogue. And, and the model that I've developed when I wrote about respecting patient autonomy is premised on a dialogical model. And I think there's some important process questions that arise from recent work in moral psychology about the influences on decision making. Um, I am a uh, avid anti-paternalist and when I'm speaking to somebody I make choices about what kind of information I'm going to present first, second, third, and last, and why. And the very order in which I present those pieces of information um, is based, if I'm paying attention, on what I think they need to hear first in order to understand the second thing. And if they said, but I want to hear number three before I hear number one, I'd be disinclined to do that because I think they need to hear number one in order to interpret number three appropriately to promote their own values and wishes. And I think that that, you know, even the most straightforward communication requires some real forethought if you're trying, if what you're trying to do is to elicit informed consent or to respect patient autonomy. And so on one level that, that ground has been covered. What does it mean to respect autonomy? How do you get informed consent? What are the different elements? But from a psychological standpoint, trying to understand where people are vulnerable, trying to understand what counts as respecting them, and yet also using your expert knowledge to shape their decision either because you think it's in their interest or because you think they need to hear it or because of some other agenda, I think that is re the, 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 the intersection between psychology and ethics and research is to me not a matter for IRBs, but it's a matter for cognitive psychologists and philosophers to really work through. And I think that that is very rich and an area worth exploring. So you have very well anticipated my next question, which is how does your role 
as a practicing clinician inform your views about ethics and research ethics? And if you want to expand, continue to expand a little bit more on that, feel free. If so as a practicing clinician um, and, and, and a philosopher, working with patients keeps me real. It reminds me what's important and um, hopefully keeps me from too much navel gazing and too much um, ivory tower introspection. And it gives me real grist for those, um, those deeper problems. I think that um, I always know when I'm in an academic world because somebody within half an hour uses the term discourse. Nobody uses the term discourse in an exam room. They talk and they play and they argue and they cry and they, and they do the things that remind us that the abstraction is not the reality. And I think that um, we do well to frequently be refocused on what is the problem. And so the problem of research ethics is a problem often of uncertainty. And how do you deal with uncertainty for the patient, for the family, for the clinician? And um, that's what new knowledge is about, is trying to have a better take on our reality and the implications of what we do. And so because patients and their families tell you what, remind you what matters, it to me informs us of what our priorities should be. If you could offer one piece of advice to our young graduate students in the sciences about the importance of ethics in science, what would that be? So people who are engaged in the scientific endeavor, I think, are to be congratulated for wanting to pursue passionately a question that they think needs to be answered. And I think what sometimes we lose, we all lose sight of, is the implications of what we do and the implications of the search, of the um, data acquisition, and of the conclusions we draw. And I remember as a graduate student writing a paper about is like a second year philosophy graduate student about whether scientists are responsible for the, um, implement, for the downstream effects of the implementation of their findings. And I argued strongly that they are. And what that requires is that people be reflective about what are going to be the effects of their actions and their words. And if they don't, then they're not being any more responsible than someone who says, well, all I'm doing is pulling the trigger. Where the, where the bullet goes is not my concern. So thinking about, the, thinking about the implications of your work is, I think, crucial and should not be paralyzing. It should inform what you do, where you go, and where you place your priorities. Is there anything else you would like to share with us related to your own topic and your own work? Well, I guess for me, um, what to me is in certain ways most interesting about the thing that is interesting to me about what I do is the ability to cross boundaries. Um, in science, it's called translational science. You, you take something that is theory and you bring it into practice. And in, in my philosophical roots, which are the, you know, the legacy of John Dewey, I was actually taught by my professor at, at Antioch College was John Dewey's last graduate student. And so I have that direct lineage. But you know, the, the notion of the reflex arc, the notion of praxis, of taking your ideas and bringing them to the world and then bringing back the lessons and 
not giving too much um, sort of credibility, but too much emphasis on the boundaries between fields because you know, math and physics and chemistry at the highest levels, they all, they're all about describing the same kinds of events. They just have partitioned them differently. And I think that the best kind of work usually is, is that work that is translational, that crosses boundaries and draws the useful insights of different fields. So um, it, it lands you in hot water with purists uh, and it can alienate you sometimes from people who think what you're doing is um, too applied, too um, uh, unrigorous by their conceptual standards. And the thing I, I, that I found very helpful is to find like minds who value um, an interactive, um, reflexive approach to examining an idea and finding a solution. Dr. Lima, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for your interest.